it is my it is my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Peter Scotchpo, who is one of the most famous and most eminent sociologists in the United States, whose works uh, many of us uh, uh, use continually. For example, I'm teaching her book on uh, revolutions, the early one in the, in the class right now. But she's much more than just that book. Uh, uh, she is Victor S. Thomas Professor of Government and Sociology at, at Harvard. She has taught at the University of Chicago as well and guest lectured uh, elsewhere. She is, yes, indeed, the author of States and Social Revolutions, but that's her, uh, I think, think, her first published book. Uh, since uh, the study of revolutions, uh, she moved uh, to uh, studies of the welfare state. Uh, social policy. The famous book is Protecting Soldiers and Mothers, but she also has another called Social Policy in, in the United States. She's co-authored several books, which I, I won't uh, uh, mention, except for two. Uh, one with Kenneth Feingold, a, a State and Party in America's New Deal, and the one that is most uh, uh, germane uh, to uh, our topic here is with Vanessa Williamson, The Tea Party and the Remaking of Republican Conservatism. Again, a book that we are using in lots of, uh, lots of classes. Uh, in another class, I am using it uh, currently. Uh, she has, uh, 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 as I said, lectured at the New School before, and in my memory, at least twice, but probably more often than that. Uh, once very early in the 80s, I remember that. Uh, and then much, much more uh, more recently, as we have been discussing some of the related topics for this uh, lecture series. So really, it is the greatest pleasure, and, and I'm also grateful for her generosity in, uh, uh, in, in doing, this, uh, doing this with us. Uh, Atena, uh, you have uh, the floor, uh, and, uh, and we will have a discussion after your, what we call the longest lecture that you're going to, going to give. Okay, well, thank you so much, Professor Arado. I have, I did indeed visit the New School over the years from time to time. And, and about a decade ago, I also visited Budapest. So I can picture the city and uh, I always like that. Um, let me go right into it um, today. My lecture is called The Elite and Popular Roots of Republican Party Extremism. And you might say, well, why that topic? Um, the United States these days, we're having a lot of debates about threats to US democracy, and that started even before we had armed um, rioters um, overrun the US Capitol uh, on January 6th. Um, and so, you know, there are different views, and there have been, about what the biggest threat might be. Um, Donald Trump's personal pathologies have certainly been front and center, more, more front and center than most people would like for uh, uh, since, uh, 19, uh, to, since 2015 at least. There are certainly a lot of people who think about big money in politics and we're gonna touch a little bit on that topic here, but um, I'm gonna suggest that big money is not just on one side in politics and um, the, the real issue about money in politics is how it's spent and how it's organized, not just the amounts. Structural racism, of course, is very much um, a live topic uh, on the American left in general, and there, it's impossible to overlook the racial tensions that are in anxieties about change that are feeding in to the current uh, moment, uh, which are new versions of very longstanding uh, pathologies in American politics. But the answer that I'm going to offer, and one that pulls together some of these strands in a different way, is Republican Party extremism. And the even to the point now of an embrace of a form of minority authoritarianism um, that, that goes as far as uh, a willingness of both leaders and followers to subvert basic constitutional and legal principles and move over into uh, outright violence or threats of violence, but is fundamentally grounded in an approach to politics and governance that tries to exclude 
the opponent rather than beat them fair and square in electoral contests. So that's what I wanna talk about today. Um, these charts are a few years old, but the current trends would be even more so. Uh, they show that the polarization that's often discussed in American politics has been in recent times very tilted toward the right. That wouldn't have necessarily been true in earlier phases of US history, but it is definitely true now. These charts are based on quantitative indices that political scientists use based on votes in our US House of Representatives. And um, it, this is a more symmetrical version of exactly the same data and uh, shows that there has been a pulling away of the two parties for quite a long time, actually since the 1960s. But in the earliest years, it was somewhat a matter of Democrats sorting themselves out as conservative Southern Democrats uh, turned into Republicans. After the 1980s, um, that process continued, but the pulling away of the Republican Party toward ever further right wing stands on all kinds of policy issues has continued uh, to the surprise of political scientists, even in periods when Republicans have lost national elections as well as won them the old idea of the median voter theory in which parties that lose will move toward the center, which governed much of the study of American politics when I was a young social scientist, that idea has very much gone by the wayside. So the puzzle is, what, why has the Republican Party so steadily, um, excuse me, radicalized and um, through periods of electoral wins and losses to the point where it may now be, uh, significant chunks of its leaders may now not be interested in winning uh, elections by appealing to more voters and certainly not those toward the center. M my argument here is that we can't just point to one factor. And of course, debates that occur in the social sciences and then occur in punditry often try to find one factor. Um, but I uh, learned long ago in my work on revolutions, and I've uh, learned it again and again in my work on various strands in American politics, that big changes are often fueled by separate tendencies that come together and create a, a synergy with one another. And in this case, there are both elite prongs and grassroots prongs ongoing forces that have a few fueled Republican radicalism, at least in its most recent phase since the 1990s into the present. And uh, they are really separately determined, although they have come to interact now during the era of the of Trump uh, presidency and the Trumpist movement. Uh, the elite prong, I'll uh, argue, is due to the uh, rising influence of extra party organizations uh, put together by organized millionaires and billionaires to advance ultra free market economic agendas, uh, weakening and destruction of labor unions, removal and prevention of government regulations, especially those having to do with global warming, tax cuts for the wealthy, destruction of the capacities of, of public institutions to, to meet problems. We just saw that in the state of Texas with an energy crisis. Uh, in a winter storm. So that is one prong. The other prong, which has also unfolded in recent times, got a real big kickstart back at the beginning of the Barack Obama presidency with uh, the emergence of local tea parties. Um, and it uh, was characterized at the time because many of the free market elites claimed it was so that the Tea Party was about fiscal responsibility, the same themes that animated free market elites, but actually at the grassroots, and the grassroots is the important part, I'm going to argue, um, the Tea Party surge was fueled by fears at, uh, among ordinary uh, Republican and conservative citizens about immigration and racial and generational changes in American society that they felt threatened the, their very sense of what America was all about. That Tea Party activism reached its peak in the period of, of Barack Obama's presidency, but it ended up propelling, uh, I'm gonna show, 
congressional Republican radicalization and then the rise of Donald Trump. And now, by now, the embrace of authoritarian beliefs among half to three quarters of Republican voters. So um, the points I'm gonna be making in this lecture draw on a series of research projects. And I just wanna briefly highlight them because um, my colleagues and I approach the study of American politics a little differently than many do. Many focus on public opinion polls on um, election statistics and on um, votes in Congress or measures undertaken by presidents. We pay attention to all of those things, but we are interested, and some, uh, and particularly in sociology, look at social movements that are defined in very broad uh, social culture terms. We look at all of those things, but we, um, in our research, look at organizations and networks among organizations because we believe that organizations often concentrate resources and participation in politics and allow certain lines of, of action and work for change to be sustained over time. So we take that literally. Our research often consists of, of putting together a very difficult to assemble lists of organizations and their resources of various kinds, looking at how they relate to one another, how they relate to the major political parties and we do that both at the national level and across states and in local areas. Um, that's how Vanessa Williamson and I approached the Tea Party in our book back in 2011. Uh, since then, uh, my colleagues and I have gone even further in our work. We have now assembled a list of the named local Tea Parties, some 2,000 to 500 to 3,000 of them by congressional district, state, and a, a local counties. We know when they organized and what their names were and where they were. Um, that has not been an easy data set to put together. Um, we have also, my colleagues and I, looked at the elite level of organization in American politics and the shifting terrain politics which I co project, which I co-led with Alexander Hurdle Fernandez, now at Columbia University and actually now in the uh, Biden Labor Department for two years. Uh, that project has tracked changes on the right and left in think tanks, party committees, advocacy groups, constituency mobilizing organizations, and consortia or ongoing organizations of millionaires and billionaires who donate money, not just to candidates and parties, but to other organizations on the right and left of American politics. It's out of this work that we've documented the COPE network that I'm going to be discussing in this lecture. And then right after the 2016 election, three colleagues at Harvard, Mary Waters, a sociologist, myself, mainly a political scientist these days, and a health economist, Kathy Swartz, uh, organized a project to start doing repeated visits and interviews with group and institutional leaders in two Trump counties, one medium-sized city county, one smaller town county, and two apiece in North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. I hit the road with my by then retired physicist husband to travel thousands of miles to visit these places and revisited most of them uh, the following year. I haven't been able to go again this year, but on those visits, I did face-to-face -face, um, interviews with local Republican and Democratic leaders with the leaders of surviving Tea Parties, yes, there are still some that meet, with the leaders of local anti-Trump resistance groups, with business leaders, with religious leaders, with um, 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 police chiefs, uh, and with newspaper editors. And uh, that has been an eye-opening experience in every way. And um, out of all of this work, my colleagues and I are now working on a long-term study of the effects of the Tea Party organizing surge of 2009 and after the anti-Trump grassroots resistance surge that broke out after 2016 and their long term impacts on governance and the two major political parties. So that's the research base I'll be drawing on. And it's uh, a lot of it is in the newly published book, which is right here. Um, let me start with the elite forces that have been driving the latest phase of rightward extremism in the Republican Party over the past 20 years. And understanding that starts with a very simple move that we made in our research. We 
compiled our lists of think tanks, constituency organizations, non-party funding organizations, elite ones in particular, issue advocates and Republican party committees. And then we simply look at their budgets. In the year 2002, we picked non-presidential years. And again, in the year 2014. And we did this on the left too, but the changes we saw on the right were truly startling. In that short period of time, Republican party committees went from controlling 53% of the aggregate uh, budget resources uh, to 30%. And non-party funders uh, and other and some of the organizations, particularly constituency organizations and think tanks that they were funding, uh, gained uh, share. And when we looked more closely at both the pre-existing and newly created between 2002 and 2014 organizations that were capturing uh, greater resource shares, the overall pie was growing, but the shares were shifting outside the party. When we looked at that, we found that a lot of the organizations were in the Koch network. Now, first of all, the Koch network is not brand new. Uh, it is a network of political organizations that has been nurtured over many years by the late David Koch, who just died last year, and Charles Koch, who's still alive, still with us, uh, uh, who are the um, top dogs in a massive uh, Coke Industries um, um, conglomerate based in Kansas that has made them among the wealthiest of the Forbes 400 millionaires and billionaires in the United States. They've ranked pretty high for a long time. They have also been very involved in right-wing politics in the United States since the 1980s. This chart um, is a names the organizations that we consider to be part of the Coke political network. In our research, we don't care about every organization that Charles or David Koch wrote a check to. We don't think that writing checks to politicians or organizations, which is the kind of thing that most students of money and politics focus on, is particularly interesting. First of all, you can't find out a lot about a lot of it, but also, you know, you, you write a check to a party committee and they do with it what they want to. The Kochs figured that out a long time ago, and they instead have created organizations that they and their close associates directly control. Back in the 1980s, they were free market libertarian think tanks. Those are the blue bars at the top. Then they went into a phase of creating kind of policy advocacy organizations to do things like oppose global warming regulations, try to get rid of uh, Medicare and social security, or to block Obamacare when Barack Obama was in office. But the organizations that really matter recently are the ones toward the bottom. Starting in 2004, the Kochs decided to go far beyond their own wealth and to start convening what eventually became hundreds of millionaires and billionaires, like-minded, uh, usually husbands and wives, heads of companies, in the energy sector, but also um, manufacturing and uh, all kinds of other companies spread all over the United States who were dissatisfied with how far right the Republican Party had gone under the George Bush Bushes. Uh, they also then created a bank, the Freedom Partners Chamber of Commerce, to collect donations at those twice yearly posh meetings and channel them to other organizations. And as we're going to see, the organization they channeled most of these resources to grew into po a political party-like organization that paralleled and intertwined with the Republican Party called Americans for Prosperity. Um, I'll leave these slides with the organizers and if anybody wants to look at the list in greater detail, it's described here. Now, the interesting thing about the Koch Network described in that way is that after its launch in the early 2000s, it quickly started raising resources that rivaled and eventually by 2016 overtook the Republican Party committees themselves. Just this network, and that's not counting various other ultra free market uh, organizations out there. Uh, now, I'll just divert for a minute to say that big money in American politics during an era in which the very wealthy keep getting very wealthier, that's been true since 1979 and it hasn't stopped till this day, 
Um, the Koch Network is not the only consortium of big donors that organized itself in the early 2000s. There was also one on the progressive liberal left for millionaires and billionaires of that uh, mindset. Uh, it's called the Democracy Alliance. It formed in 2005. And for the first few years, by the estimates that we've put together through very careful research on these secretive organizations, we use every possible leak of documents, every possible source we can finagle. I can't even name the sources we use. Our best estimates are that the DA in the early years had more members, that is millionaires and billionaires who pledged a certain minimum amount of giving each year to organizations approved by the consortium. And then the Koch seminar uh, started to overtake them. And as you can see, did far more than overtake them by 2016 and 2017. Many more people in attendance, four to 500 millionaires and billionaires by that juncture, twice a year in a posh resort, donating tens to hundreds of millions of dollars to recommended organizations. Uh, the fundraising pledges, also um, rose along with the membership on the right. So you can say that organized big money was very purposely being channeled into strategic political causes uh, among elites on the right more than on the left, but you can't say that it was absent on the left. Uh, in our research, and I won't tarry too long on this, we've actually got a whole article that was published in 2016 called When Mega Donors Unite. Uh, that tracks the ways in which these organizations channel wealthy people's money to other organizations. And the key finding is that the people on the right act like Leninists, small l. They concert their money and give it to a small number of closely controlled and interrelated organizations, above all, Americans for Prosperity, that I'll come to very soon. While the democratic and progressive donors create a marketplace and scatter their money to hundreds of organizations. Uh, so it's free market anarchy on the left among America's wealthy, and at least for that period in leading into the Trump era, it was, um, uh, uh, excuse me, progressive anarchy, free market anarchy on the left, and free market Leninism on the right. The key organization on the right that I want to direct our attention to uh, that rose to prominence from 2004 to the present time is Americans for Prosperity. It's a particularly interesting organization because like all Coke organizations, it's controlled from the top in a very corporate fashion. And if people fail at their jobs, they're out instantly. There's no long-term investigation or worry about fairness or any of the things that happen on the liberal side of the spectrum. Um, but uh, it, it is also organized like a federation. In other words, it's got a national headquarters, it's got state headquarters and, and, and operatives, and then it's got, in many places, key states, local offices. So it parallels government and political parties in the United States. And if you look at the very dark areas on this map, before Barack Obama even ran for the presidency, the Koch network was organized uh, over almost half of the US population in 15 states with, with directors. And among those states are states that have turned out to be very important in the right turn in American politics. Wisconsin, which used to be a leftist stronghold, liberal stronghold, North Carolina, Florida, Ohio, Michigan. In fact, in my visit to Wisconsin in 2017, I actually found three political party-like offices on Main Street in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, and Americans for Prosperity. So as Philip Bump at the Washington Post wrote once, Americans for Prosperity both in its size and its structure and its ability to combine paid operatives with volunteer activists actually rivaled the two major political parties. Here's how Americans for Prosperity has worked. As I pointed out, it combines central direction with federated organization 
by now across more than three quarters of the US states. It both deploys grassroots activists and does lobbying, media, and contributions to candidates. And it does these things continuously, not just in election uh, years, but in between in ongoing policy campaigns. It adds new heft to state level policy campaigns across the 50 US states working in close cooperation with the American Legislative Exchange Council, which organizes Republicans in state legislatures and with free market think tanks that exist in every state and put out so-called studies to prove that liberal policies are bad. It maintains a disciplined focus on tax cuts, opposition to business and environmental regulations, cuts in social spending, and attempts to weaken the public sector unions and other political opponents. In fact, the head of Americans for Prosperity, Tim Phillips, once said that they had modeled themselves on the public sector unions. They considered them their chief rivals. They both imitated them and, and sought to weaken their hold in politics, and they have been extremely successful at that. Now, this network has brought about change on, in politics on the right through its continuous action in election periods and policy campaigns through the resources that it's able to deploy to help candidates and office holders. And you can say that it's sort of colonized the Republican Party, but it did that not by simply moving into the Republican Party, but by organizing alongside it and working to elect and appoint conservatives through the Republican Party and then prod them once in office to enact its core agenda. In fact, in our research, we don't bother to follow the money, which is hard to do in American politics. We follow the people. And so one of the things we did at one point was to take uh, use the Wayback Machine on the internet to reconstruct the careers of all of the 58 men and women, mostly men, all whites, who became state paid state directors in Americans for Prosperity between 2004 and 2015. We track them where they came from and where they went. And you can see that they often come from Republican uh, candidate or parties or governor's staffs or election campaigns, and then they often go back to those. Um, some of them are tied to the conservative advocacy world, like anti-abortion groups or gun groups, but that's not the major emphasis. And they rarely bother with elected office. Their form of influence is to colonize the Republican party and to staff the governor's offices or the Senate offices uh, once the people are elected. Now, if you read the work of my friends and colleagues, Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson, you'll see that they, and this is typical of most analysts, treat the Koch network as if it were simply corporate interests in American politics. We do not believe that. We think that it has added a new uh, plutocratic ideological dimension on the far right to American politics that goes further toward eviscerating government's role in the economy than even the Chamber of Commerce or organized business interests or most corporations. Now, to be sure, usually the Koch network organizations and the Chambers of Commerce and business groups and corporations work in parallel. They're always trying to trim back union rights, that cut taxes, weaken market regulations, but there are times when the Koch groups actually oppose measures that mainstream business groups want. Uh, for example, uh, once the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare passed in the United States, there were big subsidies available to state governments if they would expand Medicaid coverage to the near poor. And because a lot of money was at stake, a lot of chambers in commerce and hospital associations wanted that to happen in various states controlled by Republicans. But the Koch network groups always opposed it and often won in those battles. The Koch network has waged fierce battles in Congress in Washington, DC to get congressional Republicans to stop uh, renewing the business bank backed export import bank, which subsidizes American corporations in international business. 
And it even pushes in the states against efforts by Republicans to raise levies or taxes to pay for roads. And of course, a lot of times businesses think they need roads. So that can lead to some pretty big fights. Um, more than any tensions with organized business though, the impact of the Coke, net, Coke Network uh, through state legislatures, through Congress, and ultimately through the Donald Trump presidency has been to block or policies that are favored by most Americans that could reduce inequality. For example, most Americans have long favored uh, raising the minimum wage, the federal minimum wage, they do now as well. But these organizations and the Republicans they uh, helped elect and support are very opposed. Uh, of course, they have sought to eliminate or weaken bargaining rights for public sector workers, uh, especially after the 2010 election when many state legislatures went to the Republicans. Um, they have blocked the implementation of Medicaid and other parts of Obamacare and sought to support the repeal of Obamacare. They stand against expanding social security benefits, which most Americans favor. And they even oppose public spending for infrastructure, uh, which is something that not just business associations, but 72% of Americans back in 2013 wanted to happen and overwhelming majorities want to happen now. And there will be another big fight about that uh, in the United States this spring. Uh, we did a quantitative study to look at the impact of the Americans for Prosperity on union rights after the 2010 elections when Republicans swept control of many state legislatures and governorships and immediately started enacting the most radical union busting uh, measures. Um, we entered into our equations, whether public opinion in a given state supported uh, that retrenchment, the unemployment rate, the union density rate, and uh, the partisan control of government. And even when you control for all of those things, whether or not a state had a paid AFP director in place who's able to orchestrate lobbying, grassroots action, um, all kinds of things in the state uh, was a positive predictor of success in rolling back union rights, even with partisanship and other variables controlled. The same thing has been documented in research we've done on which Republican states decided to expand Medicaid and which ones didn't. The strength of Koch Network and other far-right free market organizations in the states, which we measure, I think, in fairly clever ways, um, is very closely related to blocking Medicaid expansion. Even though Medicaid expansion is very, very popular with most Americans, including people of both races, blacks and whites, in the South, where a lot of rural areas um, have hospitals that need this money. So here's the bottom line about the elite prong of Republican radicalization that I'm talking about. The Coke Network and other free market extra party organizations have been independent and powerful drivers of Republican positions and policy outcomes. They have caused Republican candidates and elected officials to pursue agendas of policy making that are deeply unpopular. And they are associated with many enactments of unpopular policies. Um, it added heft, this Koch network created after 2004 to the same kinds of and more even more extreme anti-government agendas that had been pursued in the past by uh, and still are by the US Chamber of Commerce and the Club for Growth. Um, and we think that this organized donor clout translated into a particular kind of political organization, it's not just checks, has helped to explain three puzzling trends in American society and politics which is the ever more rightward tilted polarization in our politics, the unresponsiveness of politicians, particularly in the Republican party to mass public opinion and the enactments of many pol public policies that actually increase economic inequality in an era in which income and wealth inequality are 
at 19th century levels and rising in the United States. Let me switch now to the popular prong of radicalization of the Republican Party, because it's not exactly the same as the elite forces I've just discussed. Once the Republican Party was pretty well cocified, meaning elected politicians and office holders were taking their cues about the agendas to pursue or not pursue from these free market elites, um, it became vulnerable as a mass-based political party because a lot of the policies that were being pushed on it by the elite radicalizers were not really very popular. Uh, for example, when we talked to Tea Partiers, Vanessa and I found that they didn't want to cut Social Security and Medicare. So um, even those kinds of policies are sometimes that are called fiscally responsible, that's a misnomer, are not necessarily uh, popular even among radicals on the right at the popular level. And um, we didn't really find that for the most part they were all that concerned about tax cuts for the rich either. They didn't necessarily oppose them, but they weren't, that wasn't high on their agenda. Popular um, Tea Party people and the ethno-nationalists that have succeeded them in American politics are passionate about immigration, about opposing immigration, and very worried that government will empower and deliver benefits to lower income people, people of color, and young people that they see as building an America they cannot identify with. This uh, we call this ethno-nationalism. This ethno-nationalist popular thrust took organized form and became very visible and consequential in American politics uh, during Barack Obama's presidency. I mean, it had been there all along, but it really mobilized at that point to oppose him. Uh, and it led to radicalization of elected officials from the 2010 election onward. It uh, ultimately, fed into support for the media operator Donald Trump as he moved to grab the nomination of the Republican Party from the outside, really, in 2015, and then won the presidency in, in 2016. Back in 2009, at the start of Barack Obama's presidency, it was just a, a few, a couple of months in, when Tea Party protests against him and against the Democrats and everything they were doing in Washington, D.C. broke out on tax day in 2009. And you can see how widespread the half a million to just under one million protesters were who protested in 542 counties across the United States. Later research showed that the places that had these protests were more likely to elect Republicans and conservative Republicans in, in 20. 10, the first election after that. Uh, Vanessa Williamson and I, uh, in, the, in the spring of 2011, which is a couple years in, actually collected information from the websites of 900 locally active Tea Parties at that point. And we have since, with our various collaborators, decided that probably another 500 to 1,000 Tea Parties existed at one point or another between 2009 and the present. Uh, so, a lot of local groups formed by volunteer citizens. These groups did not get checks from the Koch brothers. They were not implanted from above. They were not astroture of creations. They were ordinary white middle-class men and women who like Americans have done throughout American history, decided something needed to be done in civic life and politics and organized themselves to do it. And what they wanted to do was to make sure Republicans didn't compromise with the hated Barack Obama or the Democrats, make sure Republicans would get tough on immigration and on um, policies that they thought benefited uh, Americans who don't work like they work for a living. The Tea Party helped to create a surge of new candidacies for the House of Representatives. That's the 1,406 in the 2010 election many of whom lost, but some of whom won and created a new radical caucus and stance in the House of Representatives that only grew after that. Uh, you can see that another surge would come eight years later when the anti-Trump resistance 
when ordinary citizens on the center and left also organized uh, two to 3,000 regularly meeting local groups, often in exactly the same places that the Tea Parties had organized before them. But I'm not gonna be able to talk about that in, that, in this uh, research, but that we have also studied that. Um, now, just to back up before and beneath what happened in 2009 and after, Obviously, there are some ongoing trends in American society and politics that feed and fuel ethno-national politics. And I'm sure a lot of you out there are thinking, well, what about the decline in manufacturing, the rise of international trade, and economic inequality? There have been a lot of studies and a lot of debates about whether it's economic populism, ethno-nationalist populism, or a combination of both. To some degree, it's a combination of both. Large stretches of non-metropolitan Amer America since the 1970s and 80s have experienced economic decline. International trade and the decline of manufacturing were part of that. Uh, but by the time you get to the Obama era, that has, was pretty far in the past. And while it's a backdrop to all that's happened since then, and particularly to the growing tensions between metropolitan and non-metropolitan America, between rising economic areas of the United States and stagnating areas. Um, we don't believe in our research that that was the front and center motivation and goal of the mainly middle class and rarely most economically stressed people who organized. Uh, in the Tea Party movement and who have been the core of Donald Trump supporters. Donald Trump supporters are often called blue collar workers. There are, certainly are some, but uh, there's often a mix up about whether it's non-college credentialed people or lower income people. Most working lower income people in the United States now are people of color in many areas. Uh, and a lot of middle-class whites who didn't get college degrees but make pretty good incomes, as well as some who went to college, are at the core of the Tea Party and ultimately at the core of Donald Trump's support as well. The more important underlying forces that at the very least have interacted with economic changes, rapid immigration in the United States until 2008, Throughout American history, anytime there are waves of new immigrants coming from somewhere new, from Ireland and Germany and Eastern Europe and the United States, from uh, Latin America, Central America, Asia and Africa after 1965, at the end of those periods, you see nativist movements. Anytime in the United States history, you see the rise and assertion of black political power, you also see backlashes. And by 2008, when Barack Obama was elected, you had the perfect storm, the end of an era of rapid immigration of people of color into the United States and the election to the presidency of an African-American with a foreign father. That was deeply shocking and frightening to native born white Americans, particularly in non-big city areas. All of this also plays out on a changing religious landscape. The United States has been for a, most of its 20 modern history, the advanced industrial society in which more people go to church than anywhere else. It still is, that's changing. It's uh, the church going population is declining and uh, many uh, church denominations are no longer growing but white evangelicals are growing often meeting in mega churches in non-metropolitan areas. And uh, as their share of the population has declined to about a quarter of the population, many white evangelicals have become more intensely engaged in politics and they are among the most reliable voters in the United States and they feel very much on the defensive. That interacts with the fears about immigration and a changing uh, racial composition of American society. And all of these groups are favored in the US Electoral College and congressional structures, uh, which gives more clout to people who can organize widely across space, many states and districts, 
uh, and Protestant evangelicals, pro-gun organizations, even the Fraternal Order of Police, which is a white police organization, have a big presence and that gives them more organizational clout than their mere share of the voting population would suggest. Uh, so all of this set the stage for an aftermath to the Tea Party outburst in the early Obama presidency in which the congressional GOP was steadily radicalized from 2010 on. And by 2015, the stage was set for the rise of the real thing in the Republican Party an ethno-nationalist um, boss man politician, uh, Donald Trump. So I just wanna say that there has been research that has explored the impact of the Tea Party movement and the other forces I'm discussing here on congressional votes. It often doesn't find big differences in congressional voting between non-Tea Party Republicans and Tea Party Republicans because Republicans in general have moved like a herd of lemmings in the same directions on both of the dimensions of radicalism I'm discussing here toward free market radicalism and toward ethno radicalism, but to the degree that there are special effects that can be attributed to popular forces and to voters. Those are a hardening of the GOP's stand toward immigration, toward uh, the treatment of undocumented immigrants in the United States, to, toward the admission of new groups of people to a country that has always flourished by admitting uh, refugees and immigrants uh, from all over the world and certainly has in recent times. And when Vanessa and I did our interviewing in the spring of 2011, that's when Donald Trump was first beginning to talk about Barack Obama as not born in America and demanding his birth certificate. And the Tea Party people we interviewed at the grassroots were delighted by that and intrigued by Donald Trump. They were not all that happy with Mitch, Mitt Romney as the emerging nominee for 2012 and had Trump chosen to run in that cycle, he would have probably had a good shot to be the Republican nominee then. And I should just say that worries about immigration were evident in some of the counties I visited. Uh, they've go, they go back a ways. They're not just there when I visited in 2017. For example, a Northeast County in Pennsylvania that has flipped from Obama to Trumpism, enthusiastic support of Donald Trump in both 2016 and 2020. It had a politician who was Trump before Trump in the early uh, uh, 2000s. He was the mayor of, a, originally a Democrat, mayor of the town of Hazleton, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, where, um, the collapse of coal and mine, uh, coal mining and industry left um, Eastern European, Italian, native born workers uh, very disgruntled and very unhappy uh, and facing an influx of Dominican immigrants from the New York City area who have remade the economy of the place but uh, provided for years perfect fodder for a politician who wanted to scapegoat them. And Lou Barletta switched to the Republican Party and made his name as a go-it-alone immigrant busting small town mayor. He was the first, one of the first politicians in the Republican Party to endorse uh, Donald Trump's candidacy in 2015 and uh, greeted him on Trump's repeated visits to large arenas with screaming supporters in Luzerne County. And Luzerne County is solidly in the Republican rank, uh, ranks in Pennsylvania by now. In North Carolina, uh, the tensions take a different form and have been inflamed by hatred and fear of, of Muslims, of which there are none to speak of in the area. But there are plenty of pastors who have made use of fears of, of Muslims that have been stoked in the United States since 2001. By the start of the 2015 electoral cycle leading toward the presidential nominations and election, Republican voters, uh, remember this is in a cocified Republican party pursuing tax cuts, regulatory cuts, had repudiated their party's leaders. Uh, uh, spring 2015 poll from, um, I think this is Pew, showed that Republican uh, voters were very unhappy 
with the job that Republicans were doing on government spending, that means that they were not pleased that they hadn't gotten rid of Obamacare. They wanted Obamacare gone because it was tied to Obama. They were unhappy that they had done too little to deal with illegal immigration. And I can tell you that grassroots conservative people in the Tea Party believe that most immigrants to the United States are illegal or undocumented, even though that's not true. And they were unhappy, as many Christian right people are, about acceptance of same-sex marriage and the failure of Republicans to appoint judges that would reverse uh, that acceptance. Uh, so the way was pretty clear uh, for a politician that ended up appealing more to those kinds of angers and fears than other Republicans do. Remember, um, many other Republicans ran for the nomination in 2015 and 16. And this poll, which was taken in, in, in May of 2016, as Trump was consolidating his hold on the nomination, showed that his, um, this poll is only showing results for Republicans and conservatives. And it shows that Trump conservatives, compared to other conservatives, very worried about growing numbers of newcomers from other countries threatening US values, very worried about Islam as more likely to encourage violence than other religions. In fact, one of my Tea Party interviewees looked across the table at the Golden Corral and told me that Islam was not really a religion. It's a radical political movement. Um, and, um, that the country, it's bad for the country that blacks, Latinos, and Asians will be a majority of the population. So those are the strongest differences between Trump and other conservatives back in 2016. As we know, by the summer of the primaries that year, Trump was gleefully insulting and dispatching what would become 16 GOP primary competitors uh, he dominated the public uh, conversations compared to all of his competitors. He got $2 billion of free media coverage, not simply from Fox News, but from all the um, outlets that could not stop watching him because of the outrageous things he said day after day. The next most coverage went to Hillary Clinton, but that was mainly negative coverage. And you can see the others got much less. Uh, he ran a law and order a campaign and reprise, in some ways explicitly imitating some of the themes of 1968. And he was strongly backed by the National Rifle Association, Border Guards, and the Fraternal Order of Police, which is our white police union in the United States. In fact, on the rare occasions when Donald Trump actually visited real groups as opposed to big rallies, we track this in our research, his visits were to either Christian right conventions, gun conventions, or local uh, uh, lodges of the Fraternal Order of Police, where he told the police that he loved them and he knew that they were being attacked by Black Lives Matter and he had their side. It worked. Trump got intense network support from groups like Christian conservatives, gun people, and police unions and tea parties that have actual roots in many local communities. The share of the population, the voting voters that he got, votes that he got in, in who, the share of the population that voted for him in 2016 was small, but it was uh, enough to, to sway the electoral college because of where the votes were located. And of course, uh, the US polity at that time had lots of people who didn't bother to vote, even though they could have. In that election, and it became more so in the most recent election, Trump scored in the red areas, suburbs, medium-sized cities, small cities, very small cities and rural areas. Suburbs are different by 2020, but not the rest. So you can see a very strong geographic skew in the polarization between the two parties. Uh, Trump counties in 2016 had more U.S. born voters, that's all the red areas, and had more voters who called themselves Americans when asked by pollsters. Um, so after squeaking into the presidency in 2016 by winning the Electoral College through carrying 
Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. And entering the White House at the same time that the Republican Party riding on the coattails of the Trump electorate strengthened its hold on the Senate and the House of Representatives. The door was opened in the United States to the fusion of the two prongs of radicalism that I have analyzed here as somewhat separately uh, impelled leading into that Trump presidency period. Especially between 2016 and 18, when the Republican Party radicalized in this way, controlled all branches of government, free market ideologues and supporters of racial ethnic crackdowns could both claim and did both claim a mandate to change political balances and policies and had quite a lot of ability to get their favored regulations and measures through. They didn't entirely succeed. They did not manage by one vote, they fell short of repealing Obamacare. Part of the reason that the Trump presidency ended up fusing elite free market radicalism and ethno-nationalist radicalism had more to do with how the Trump presidency was put together than the goals of these two prongs. The Koch brothers, Charles and David, actually refused to endorse Donald Trump in 2016. And when the donors at their uh, pre-election um, seminar meeting were polled, they favored Marco Rubio. At that time, most of the wealthiest uh, free market donors, like most of the GOP office holders, first of all, didn't think Donald Trump could win the election. So that was a big assumption many of them made. But also some of them found his racial, his overt racial um, and uh, a pit, uh, liberal bashing style um, distasteful. I think distasteful is exactly the right word. Uh, but of course, Donald Trump won the presidency with very few expectations that he was going to win. So he wasn't really prepared. He didn't have a big organization apart from his family and a few friends to actually staff the federal government. And that's where the Koch Network moved in. It provided him through Mike Pence, his vice president, with hundreds of suggestions of people to install in virtually all of the cabinet posts and departments. Um, the domestic staffing of the Trump administration was handed over to the Koch influenced uh, Republicans through Mike Prince and through uh, congressional Republicans who had plans to dismantle federal social spending slash taxes, eviscerate businesses and environment regulations and retrench voter access. The only areas that the few people around Trump retained for their own control were the ones that they knew mattered to their most intense popular supporters. They made sure to try to install uh, immigrant restrictionists, uh, really quite ruthless immigrant restrictionists in the Department of Homeland Security and in, they thought, uh, through Jeff Sessions in the Justice Department. During that period, that early period even, Republican politicians were and still are cowed by Trump and his supporters, but I think the major uh, motivation for Republicans to more and more enthusiastically get on board with the Trump presidency and even the Trump persona is that they have all been, almost a man and a woman, happy to reap the policy wins that he brought them. Uh, the regulatory eviscerations, the tax cuts for the wealthy, and uh, above all, the appointment of conservative judges. Coke Network leaders, this is Mark Short, who worked in the White House for a time and has become Mike Pence's chief of staff. Uh, he played a huge role along with Betsy DeVos, Mike Pence, Paul Ryan in the early years, all of them Koch Network regulars for years before the Trump presidency was put together.
together. Uh, he, Mark Short was the head of the Freedom Partners um, Bank that collected Koch Network donations and sent them out to other organizations. And here's Charles Koch, who had refused to endorsed Donald Trump and who Donald Trump wouldn't shake hands with when he ran into him on the golf course. Uh, that's their first big conclave with rich donors in, uh, after Trump's election when it was clear that the tax cuts were a top priority and you can see how happy uh, Charles Koch was at the, uh, the great days for America that were ahead of us, he felt, under Donald Trump. So Here's the bottom line that I wanna draw and I'll open the floor for discussion shortly. Um, GOP radicalization is an extraordinary threat to uh, American society and democracy. It is uh, an especially uh, acute threat in a two party system where it's practically impossible to displace one major political party from being competitive with the other and in which the Republican Party has important advantages built in through the Electoral College and the Senate. The post-2000 Koch moves into party-like activities captured this party and boosted its anti-government agendas more than previous elite groups have been able to do. The Trump presidency fused that Koch network takeover at the top with a Tea Party populist nativism that had worked its way into the House of Representatives and state legislatures. Uh, this fusion explains the ongoing asymmetric right polarization in American politics that just keeps getting more and more so, and the advances of policies that increase economic inequality and weaken government capacities even when many Trump supporters themselves are hurt by those policies. Um, think of the criminally negligent handling of the pandemic in the United States uh, under Donald Trump, which ended up by the summer of last year hurting his own supporters as much as anybody else. And US federalism has magnified these tendencies. Uh, that's still true. The electoral college plus a few changes, plus changes in the federal courts may allow this Trumpified GOP to regain power even after this disastrous year for Donald Trump himself as a dwindling minority willing to use manipulations and even threats of violence to rule as a minority, an unpopular minority. So what's next? Uh, as you will have gathered, I don't think the threat of Trumpism is over because of its hold over the Republican party even in the wake of the genuinely shocking, and I think for many in Congress, frightening events of January 6th, uh, two thirds of the Congressional Republican Party voted to throw out the results of the election that Joe Biden had decisively won. And Republican run states have since redoubled their efforts to cut back on voting access for democratic constituencies. Um, now, this has also been, Donald Trump has also been good for the center left in the United States in the sense that an even bigger awakening at the grassroots than the Tea Party occurred in the anti-Trump resistance that broke out after he was elected, led by older white women in communities across America who have teamed up with immigrants and African-American activists in the cities. Um, that resistance led to a turnover to the Democrats of the House of Representatives in 2018 and helped to fuel the Biden victory in 2020. But it remains to be seen whether Democrats can continue to organize across many states and localities, which they have to do in order to counterbalance. They have to win by five to eight points in elections to counterbalance the GOP advantages in the Senate and Electoral College. They have to be able to protect voter access and turn voters out even in midterm contests and even in the face of Republican state legislatures like that one in Georgia that are even now about to pass a series of measures to make it even harder for young people, people of color and Democrats in general to vote. And after they made progress in 2018 and 2020 in finding a way to balance the roughly half of Democrats who are mainstream liberals with the 
40% or so maybe who are progressive left Democrats, especially in the cities and the more liberal states, find ways to advance the goals that both care about. Will they be able to continue to do that? Bridge and also bridge divides of class and race uh, going into the crucial 2022 midterms and uh, the next presidential election in, in 2024. Whether or not Donald Trump runs, a radicalized Republican party has a strong chance of making a comeback in those elections. And if it does, it simply may not leave power again because of the degree to which um, emboldened and fearful Republican constituencies have gained a taste for using manipulative and authoritarian means to hold long-term power as an unpopular minority in a growing, diversifying America. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Scotchpole, for that comprehensive and interesting uh, and uh, partially, uh, uh, of course, uh, pessimistic uh, presentation, which we all need to, to hear, uh, needed to hear. Uh, I have already two people whose hands are up, and I will call on those two first, and uh, it's okay to, to go for two, Tata, right? Uh, sure, whatever. You, you're in charge. Yeah, well, uh, I won't call on more than two at a time, but, uh, but at least I'll start off with the two people I see right now. So first is Melissa Rousseau, and the second one is Jean Cohen. Okay, great. Hi, um, thank you so much for doing this. This was just fascinating. Um, I learned so much. Um, the question I have is the insurrection happened on January 6th and many things have happened, but for purposes of this conversation, two things that happen interest me. Um, the first is that some Republicans have left the party in droves. And the second is that some Republicans have doubled down on the twice impeached conspiracy theory, believing losing former president. <laughs> so there's this deep faction within the Republican party. Um, based on your research, what do you think, how, how do you think that's gonna impact donors um, in terms of um, um, a viable, you know, he, he, might, he might come back, but if the party is split, he might not get as many votes. Um, where's the money going to go? To which which side? The Trumpists or the um, the center Republicans? So, um, yeah, I understand your question. <laughs> it's good. Okay, so Jean, uh, your question, and then, then Professor Scotchpole will, will answer both of you. How are you doing? Nice to see you again. And nice to see you. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's a really interesting presentation, and. Um, uh, depressing, but I think the question that I have is, I mean, what you've described is of course um, the capture of a political party by a kind of parallel, not just money, but uh, a parallel quasi party in a way of its organized. Yeah, absolutely. What's the difference? But um, of course there have to be preconditions for this. I mean, uh, um, to make this possible and mm -hmm. I know, of course, you know, the literature on the hollowing out of political parties. Um, and some people, I'm, I'm trying to sort of, I'm trying to see what you think about what the mechanism really has been. Um, because, I mean, some people uh, uh, blame primaries, but of course they're not talking about this kind of parallel organization and then capture, but they still capture it because it's a two party system and they're not gonna call they haven't called themselves the American for Prosperity Party yet, but um, so uh, or or the part the primaries or what other um, mechanisms uh, actually facilitate uh, this? And um, I mean, I myself thought that or, or hope that if the Democrats um, got back to being you know strengthening the party on the ground, did the kind of like Stacey Abrams did in in uh, yeah yeah she's a good example. Good example, yeah. Um, but but I'm not sure whether you think. Well, so two things. Why 
I'm still not clear on what the why it happened and what the mechanisms really were for this kind of shift in organizational strategy and takeover. And now on the other hand, um, whether apart from all the other issues of progressives versus you know less progressive in the Democratic Party, whether it would be possible to create not and not just the resistance, but create party structures on the ground that could that would be able to really counter this. Um, and uh, well. Well, those are all big questions. So let me start with uh, Melissa's uh, questions about the Republicans. There are splits to be sure. I would not say that people are leaving in droves. Um, there is some evidence that uh, people are deregistering right after um, the election and also January 6th in key states in somewhat larger numbers than you would expect people to deregister as Republicans, they're usually re-registering as independents. Those tendencies are going on and have been going on for quite a while, particularly among educated uh, suburban people, um, frankly, of all colors. Uh, they may have decided this Republican party isn't what they thought it was. However, they're not winning. I mean, I you know, I, maybe they will win eventually. I'm not, may, I'm not into the prediction business, but it has been pretty startling to see how quickly and how massively um, elected Republicans have re-embraced Donald Trump himself um, and uh, continued to uh, propagate the uh, lie, which is believed fervently by many grassroots people, that this election was stolen. Now, I have to say that lie has been out there for a long time. The idea that if young people and people of color in cities vote a lot, that there's something corrupt about that, that is very much part of the grassroots Republican way of thinking about things for quite some time. I've had perfectly decent and sensible people look me in the eye in interviews and say that to me and not back off when I say to them, well, you know, those are big places. It takes a while to count the votes. I mean, I'm not the most orthodox interviewer. If I've established rapport with somebody, I will sometimes gently push back uh, to see what they say. Uh, and I've never gotten anybody to blink on that, no matter how otherwise sensible um, they are. So that that is, um, um, I don't believe it's as dangerous as some of the media say it is, because I think it's been there for a long time. But I think it is dangerous to see elected office holders trying to downplay the intersection insurrection, trying to claim it was Antifa. Antifa does everything bad in America now, according to right-wing people. And it barely exists, uh, you know? So it's quite remarkable to see that. And that's obviously a racially coded set of fears that people are invoking. Uh, so will the donors back off? Yeah, some of them are backing off, although they have secret channels through which they can give anyway. And they'll redirect their giving, like the Coat Network did in 2016, to the Senate contests. And a lot of those voters will vote for Donald Trump, too. So, you know, there's been a sort of good cop, bad cop routine here going on for quite a while, and they're about to try another couple rounds of it. Um, plus, Donald Trump is able to get ordinary middle class people, including people of barely adequate means to live their life, like the lady in Maine I bought my two kittens from this summer to send in money. She, he assembles hundreds of millions of dollars that way. And he will use that money to channel to candidates he wants. So he's a force no matter whether the big corporate donors back off or not. Uh, I think sometimes on the left, we overestimate the role of big donors particularly if they're not well organized and working in concert with others to, to, to affect outcomes. I want to, to Jean's questions, look, one of the big things we do in our research is look for the mechanisms. We're very interested in the mechanisms. And we do think about left and right together. I, I haven't talked about the left in this, but we do, we research the left too and make a lot of people on the left very unhappy with what we write about because we, we just, you know, we're not in the PR business. We're not in the wishful thinking business. Um, so the way the Coke Network did it was to build up this parallel 
party-like organization, which didn't have to take on any of the responsibilities of an actual political party, but was able to channel activists and money in primary elections and then in governing campaigns over whether or not to pass a bill to expand Medicaid in ways that really work in an electorate that's slack. Remember that pie chart I showed you for 2016 of how few Americans were voting? In that kind of situation where Americans were becoming more and more disillusioned with what government could do for them, uh, this has changed recently. So I, I'm not talking about now, I'm talking about 20 years leading into 2016 uh, if you can organize people like that and combine donations and uh, primary clout and clout uh, for general election campaigns going door to door, that's what the Koch Network does in key states. They channel the money into key states at, at election time. And then if you can deploy it during a, a policy campaign to back up the, 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 the guy or woman who's doing what you want, that's a very powerful inducement. But the other thing they do is place their people in key positions in the campaigns and in the governing um, offices um, and then recruit people out of those offices who know the lay of the land in a particular state's politics. For example, in Wisconsin, very closely intertwined with the people who run the legislature in Wisconsin from the Republican side who are their cat's paws and who have carried the day again and again in that highly gerrymandered state. And they keep their eye on the ball. They keep their eye on the ball of winning elections and placing people and shaping the agenda. They don't get all uh, distracted by things like being moral. They don't care about morality. I mean, they have their own definition of morality. I don't want to insult them, but they're not, they're not particularly concerned about religious right causes. They're not particularly concerned about uh, uh, whether the left thinks they're good people. Um, so um, that's how they did it. Now, can you do that on the left? The public sector unions used to do it. It's not for nothing that they were mainstays of the Democratic Party for a long time, but they've been weakened enormously. Um, and in any event, probably for the Democratic Party, it has to be like Stacey Abrams just explained in her interview in the New York Times. It's necessary for both civic groups outside the party and groups inside the party to revitalize and reform the Democratic Party and operate a kind of symbiosis, inside-outside symbiosis that focuses the way they do in Georgia, they have in Georgia, on registering voters, continuously engaging voters, and turning out voters. My research group is right now comparing North Carolina and Georgia. And we're doing the same kind of research I just introduced to you all today. We're looking at all the organizations and how they played out over a two decade period and I'm just so amazed at what Stacey Abrams did there. But I will have to tell you that it, she didn't do it alone. She did it by working with and creating a network of organizations with an absolutely ruthless focus on enlarging the electorate and strengthening the Democratic Party of Georgia. And that is very different from what leftists do in most states. In most states, they, they're interested in yelling at state government. So there's a real difference. And, uh, but that's what has to happen on the Democratic side. Um, okay, thank you. So the floor is open. Uh, I'll take one or two questions, depending how many I see right away. I don't see anybody just yet. Uh, so since I don't see anybody else yet, I will ask you a short one myself. Uh, I, I, I like your book with uh, with Williams very much, and I use it. And I just want to feature one particular part of it because I think it's kind of, well, uh, you couldn't do everything today, but it wasn't part, so much part of the presentation, namely the media strategy. Yeah. Because uh, if you uh, 
take these two prongs, which you so well describe, uh, there are huge differences between them on, on, on issues. And, and I don't want to go into them, but, but uh, people, people know that on immigration, on, on issues like that, uh, there are significant differences. And, uh, you know, in your book, you have, you have the phrase, uh, 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 the media is, is, is megaphone, I'm sorry, cheerleader and, uh, and megaphone. Uh, yeah, right, that was the, uh, and, and it seemed to me that that particular formulation doesn't deal with how you deal with contradictions of this type. Uh, and uh, today you dealt with the contradictions in one particular way, namely how the Trump government by its composition gives both of these sides enough so that they can symbolically identify themselves with what is going on. But doesn't this have to be done also on the level of the media strategy? Uh, yeah. which, which, which is, it means that the media have to be more than just megaphone or even cheerleader. It has to deal with, with contradiction. And that probably will come up on the democratic side too. Okay, so well, you yeah. know, I think that the uh, Republican Party has been advantaged overall, and there's some quantitative research even that shows this, by the rise of a dedicated propaganda sector in American media around Fox News, talk radio. Those were very important in the rise of the Tea Party in the first place. And by now, there's a lot of websites as well. I don't know how much of that is the major tool that the free marketers rely on. I think they rely more on appeals to fellow elites, channeling money and shaping careers. Um, shaping careers is an extremely important mechanism of political control. And, and I think social scientists don't study it enough. Looking at where people come from, where they're headed, and where they think they're headed will give you a lot of leverage over what they will do. And um, one of the things we've seen is that Donald Trump was able to get people who didn't agree with him about a lot of things to end up doing what he wanted by threatening to destroy their careers or advantage their careers if they uh, do what he wants. Trump himself and the Republican Party have both been helped by the Fox News sector, which not only caters to ethno-nationalism on the popular side, it stokes it. I mean, I don't watch Fox News, but some of my research assistants have, and it's a constant diet of fear-mongering about immigrants and uh, racial minorities and women. I mean, let's not underestimate the degree to which men angry about women out of place. And believe me, we are out of place. It's true, we're out of place. And it's very disquieting, these changes that have occurred in gender relations over the last 20 years. And it's not for nothing that Donald Trump tries to portray himself as a tough guy, even when he's a simpering wimp. In fact, um, you know, all these things are constant fare in the right-wing media. Um, and they, ha they have both, I think Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson lay this out pretty well in their latest book, they've been very important in boosting the ability of the right to shape popular perceptions. There are vast stretches of America where only Fox News is on. And it's on in people's homes from beginning of the day till the end of the day. Horrific as that thought may be. Um, I'll never forget the seventh question to one of the Tea Party people I interviewed in 2011. I, the seventh question is, we're sitting there in the Comfort Inn and I say, where do you get your news? He had a rare sense of humor. He looked at me and he smiled and he said, not where you do. Before he told me that he watches Fox News from six to eight hours a day. So um, now the downside of that is that Sean Hannity ends up being more powerful than um, some right-wing donors who might prefer a pro-business approach to things in the GOP. So there are downsides to this capture by these outside organizations, but you know, after January 6th, I thought maybe this is gonna come apart, this unholy marriage of the free marketers and the ethno-nationalists. And you know, when I interviewed a a wealthy, I haven't interviewed very many members of the Coke Network, but 
I did get a chance to interview one very wealthy man who runs a business, very, very successful businessman, very good businessman, I would say. And his daughter and son were there at the same time. And I never bring Donald Trump at the, up at the beginning of interviews. I bring him up after a while. So uh, I brought him up and, and uh, the daughter looks at me and she says, you know, he's so crude. I really, I just wince every time he tweets, every time he opens his mouth. But I thank God every day he's in office because he's a businessman and he knows what it takes to build a strong business economy in America. And the old man, the father, who had gone on and on and told me about how he values honesty in his business. And actually, I have no reason to disbelieve him. I think he does. I mean, he's a self-made, very successful businessman. Um, at the end of the interview, I said, well, you know, you've told me um, how much, how you wouldn't put up with an employee who was dishonest with you. And I, I said, I believe you. So does it bother you <laughs> that Donald Trump lies all the time? He looked at me and he says, he doesn't work for me. He tells his people what they want to hear, and that's the price of getting him elected. I realized, of course, in the middle of the night that I should have looked back and said, well, gee, silly me, I thought he worked for all of us. And I probably would have said that because I liked the guy and uh, no problem. He, he's not a wilting flower, so he wouldn't have hesitated to have an answer. But, you know, there has been a very self-conscious decision by many of these free market um, um, millionaires and billionaires and the politicians like Mitch McConnell that they have groomed and supported and relied upon that they can ride this tiger and it won't eat them. That's what the elites in Nazi Germany thought in the 1930s too. So, you know, I don't think it's the same but um, it isn't coming apart yet. They're gonna give the jalopy a couple more horrors around the racetrack to see if they can reestablish Republican control, at least of the Senate in the next election. Yeah, so your answer seems to be, and it's really very good, that the media strategy directs on prong, is directed at prong two, the popular prong, and what the other side gets is jobs and policy. In other words, uh, it's a clientelistic and judges oriented and policy judges. And, judges and and judges. Yeah, of course. Well, the judges, both sides must get some judges, right? Or at least the judges. Well, I, you know, I we all we hear all the time is what the judges think about abortion, but the real agenda of the Roberts Court is to dismantle the federal government in the United States. Right. My son that's, actually was a that's clerk the bargain, for, right? For but you know, then Center, so I pay attention to these things. But then, of course, you're you're saying that the mass movement doesn't really get the policies, and so, in some sense, that ought to be the vulnerability. Well, no, it gets the policies it wants. It gets an attempt to at least. I mean, you know, I asked the Tea Party guy that I I, I have interviewed in one of the key states. What it, does it bother you that the wall is not getting built? And he said, well, I don't know whether it'll ever get built because those liberals, you know, they're blocking everything he wants to do, but he's trying and that's what matters. Now, before we all get all, um, you know, contemptuous about that, I think most of us actually support politicians that are trying for things and don't always bail on them if they face opposition and can't get things done. So I don't find that understandable. I would not assume that the popular supporters of Donald Trump, who, by the way, I didn't say this, but the most interesting book I've read lately is about Christian nationalism. And it turns out Christian nationalism, which is a growing tendency in the United States, is not simply Christianity. It's not even mainly evangelical or white Protestantism. It is a fusion of political and 
Christian symbolism, which is instantiated in a very powerful way in some megachurches and in some uh, secular civic occasions. Um, but it's not the same thing as religiosity. However, both the Christian nationalists and the religious right people are getting the judges they want. They're thrilled at the installation of a majority on the Supreme Court. They expect good things from that majority, not all of which may be delivered, but they're very pleased. The gun people are very, very happy at the judges that, and the policies that have been installed. So let's not assume that even though many of these people would benefit from economic policies that Donald Trump is not pursuing, that they don't care about what he is delivering. They do care about that. Thank you very much and thank you for the, your presentation. Personally, I learned a lot. So now the, the history of this uh, uh, the situation, what is uh, turned out in the US now, it's much more clear to me. So I could understand better what, what and why it happened in the US. Um, in advance, I want to say that I'm not an, I do not follow from Hungary what's going on in the US on a daily basis, so I am an outsider. Uh, but, and I don't want to compare Hungary and the US because they are completely different countries and cases. But uh, what I was thinking about when you are uh, talking about politics, uh, that this, the, 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 in the depths of this whole problem, there is the American society. And now it, is became, it became totally divided. That's my feeling. And that's, so what you said, it says it's a, a institutional background and history and the recent political um, conflict and such, but the main question to me is what the same in Hungary, how this kind of cleavage can be yeah. moderate, moderated. And uh, um, I'm not, I, I don't have a question, and I'm much, much more curious about your opinion, but I want to say that in Hungary, my, my experience is that in this battle, what is going on with uh, 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 authoritarian uh, government and the other party, the opposition parties, has a big mistake because uh, I think a misunderstanding that the opposition parties um, always attacking the, the leading government, but they are not learning why they are leading from what yeah. from the reason that they. And this is what curious me because Andras has mentioned the media. And that's a very, it's a very important point. I think in politics, you always talk about parties, system, um, democratic rules and such, but we do not really focus enough, I think, on the personalities. Mm -hmm. The personality of Trump and what he did, what did he do? I, th I think what the Trump did entered the new way of communication, even we don't lie. The tweeting, yeah. On a daily basis, a couple of times he was communicating with the society. Yeah, yeah. He was lying and he was, uh, he was saying terrible things, but visibly half of the voters liked it. And yeah. the, in this case, the major challenge is that I take the technique. I take the, what I can learn on a positive way that the society needs a communication. We need that the president is talking and talking and talking, but the question is that what is what what the president is saying, but the technology is, and I think that's something what probably we can learn from the Trump area that this is somehow popular and people need this, and if uh, Biden could fill it up with a different content but follow the technology. Should uh, should be much more, I think, because this is a it's a new new time. I think, in the internet and the uh, whole communication area and the, and the 
media. This is a brand new situation now in, 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 in the political system and the political life in a society. So you can, you have to use it, but you have to carefully or convincingly trying to shift it to a different content. Mm -hmm. And maybe this content, if it's presented well, it, can, it could have an echo from the society, even from that side who liked Trump when he was lying and saying these stupid uh, tweeters. What do you think about this? Look, I think communication modalities and the media sectors are a very important part of this, but I don't think they operate in exactly mirror image ways on the right and left, at least not in the United States. Now, I don't think I'm going to turn out to be the person to talk about Twitter very effectively. I don't tweet. I will never tweet. I think Twitter is the work of the devil. And yet, yeah, it was an extremely important part of, of Trump's presidency. There is no question that in his tweets and also in his big rallies, he is a masterful performer. He is very, very good at linking up the profound insecurities and narcissism of his own personality with genuine anger and genuine nostalgia felt by millions of people who follow him. Now, Joe Biden is not going to be able to do the same thing. And if he tried, it would not work. Uh, he does have a communication strategy. It is aimed at a different uh, set of yearnings, uh, yearnings for a degree of competence and empathy for less in your face stuff and more just plain honesty and decency. And he projects those things not as constantly and not as Twitter, but um, in very carefully chosen. Uh, media settings, even under pandemic conditions. Uh, he has been underestimated by the American left every step of the way. The only sector of the American electorate that did not underestimate him were uh, African Americans above the age of 35 to 40, who are responsible for nominating him and are the bedrock of his support. Um, and they're the bedrock of the Democratic Party, particularly the older women among them. Um, but you know, you are seeing a kind of effort on the left in the United States, the liberal left, the Democratic Party, to meld face to face with internet based forms of communication. I think they suffered this last summer from not being able to go face to face in voter contacting. I think that hurts when you're dealing with particularly Latinx voters. Um, interestingly enough, the Stacey Abram networks of organizations in Georgia did go face to face, particularly in the period between the general election and the runoff where they turned out more voters than ever before and built larger margins than Biden had in the election. But the middle class white women who fueled the 2018 surge, they went face to face. And a lot of them did not go. You know, they're vulnerable to the virus. The virus is scary um, this past summer. And I think that helped to cost down ballot. You know, I just think this, this whole question of communications is partly that the right has a propaganda dedicated sector that its older voters watch. There is no counterpart on the left in the United States. It's true that a lot of people watch, you know, uh, Rachel Maddow and watch MSNBC, but not nearly as many or nearly as consistently or nearly as monomaniacally as the people, uh, even of the same age groups who watch on the right. So when you're dealing with the left, you have to deal with a mix of face-to-face -face and different modes of communication. And among young people, the tweeting and the, uh, may, may actually work. 
but it probably isn't going to work for people in my age group. So um, once again, you see that the Democrats on the left in the United States have uh, tougher mountains to climb. It's not bad to have a tougher mountain to climb. The Georgia Democrats and liberals had a tougher mountain to climb than the ones in North Carolina that we're comparing them to. And they toughened up their muscles election cycle after election cycle and the, the tortoise overtook the hare in the in 2020. And it's because of that that Joe Biden has a chance to have a presidency. Thank you. Literally, January 5th was more important than January 6th, even if January 6th is what shocked everybody in America and that everybody's watching. Thank you. So Agnes Gouveia was next. Thank you. Um, I, I have a lot of questions and unfortunately there is not enough time to uh, raise all of them and especially not to answer them, but, uh, but some of them, I mean, maybe these are very basic questions and, uh, and uh, rooted in my ignorance, you know, I'm no, not a okay. citizen. So, you know, questions from Hungary. Uh, so one of them is about the church and the role of the church you mentioned, you know, there is a kind of uh, uh, growing and increasing Christian nationalism, which is not religion, but, uh, but much more a kind of uh, fusion of political movement and uh, ideological movement, maybe, if I mm -hmm. understand. Mm -hmm. It is. And, uh, and my question is from, you know, from European perspective, you know, I mean, the role of uh, the church is totally different in the United States than in Europe, for instance, in Hungary. You know, actually the, uh, the European experience, uh, uh, according to the European experience, uh, church and state uh, are pretty close to each other, especially in Hungary. Actually, the church and state are pretty highly intertwined. And, uh, and uh, of course, I visited several times the uh, United States and I just experienced that, uh, oh, actually, church is a totally different something and religion is totally different something than, for instance, in Hungary. And in Europe, there are a lot of small churches, uh, churches that I never heard about, obviously. Uh, uh, once I remember I was not able to make difference between the, the numbers uh, uh, in the table right uh, along, along uh, I, I think, uh, 36 or something. Uh, there were some numbers. I was not able to tell whether these numbers are the price of the fuel or some uh, some uh, sites from the Bible, you know, because these kind of citations are just taken in the same way. It was so confusing. Yes. And so every second corner, there is a small, small church. I mean, not in the big cities, but, you know, for instance, in, you know, <laughs> in other rural uh, uh, part of the country. And uh, so I just would like to know how these these small, very fragmented churches, uh, uh, or the way how they relate to the to the state, could gain such an effort and such a power to influence directly uh, mainstream politics. So this is one of the question. Maybe, of course, it's a very basic question, and it, you know it very well. But and the second question, maybe as very basic as well. I mean, I was just listening to you and it was really a very clear and, and thank you, it was a very clear, uh, mind clearing kind of lecture, at least for me. And I, you just told a word and I have a lot of experience and I heard a lot of news and speeches of Trump and so on and so on. So, so and I, I was, I mean, you were speaking about, you know, this kind of highly marketized groups and you know, you know, this kind of very much neoliberal uh, approach on the one hand. On the other hand, I heard, I mean, you were speaking about the Tea Party and the grassroots, grassroots movement, and you were speaking about the ethno-nationalism in, uh, in the United States. So that sounds, and as far as I remember, Trump, 
you know, especially this kind of buzzword, you know, um, uh, uh, make America uh, great again, for instance, or, 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 you know, this kind of generalizing uh, uh, populist kind of uh, statement. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a very that, populist appeal. Yeah, that, that. And, and, and that, I think, that's a kind of communitarian approach, you know, so they try to, so is that, is that any, any, make, is that make any sense to use this kind of, uh, 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 this kind of classification, you know, I mean, individually based or liberal approach and communitarian approach, or we can see a kind of uh, mixture of these two approaches and we can see the worst from both approaches. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, uh, my third question would be about the public deliberation. So, I mean, that was in the United States. I mean, actually, United States was one of the foreigner countries where a public de deliberation was really pretty strong, and especially during the Obama era. And, uh, and uh, I remember I, I was very lucky and I was able to participate in some of these kind of community debates, public deliberative actions or something like that, a city, uh, uh, I mean, town halls, or, you know, these, there are a lot of different uh, forms of this kind of public deliberations. And I, I was deeply convinced about that uh, in your society, there is a very strong community-based uh, 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 um, uh, bottom-up kind of uh, movement, uh, uh, which is actually assisted by politicians to discuss about things, to share things, to make uh, deliberative decisions and to, to make the local community a partner and so on and so on. What happened with all these? So why, uh, why, for instance, this kind of uh, uh, grassroots? Uh, I mean, the far right grassroots or far right grassroots is actually used the the means of public deliberation. I don't know. I just would like to see a little bit more clear about that, about this thing. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, these are big questions. I mean, you know, I. Um wasn't talking about the center or left of American politics at all in this lecture. I alluded to it a couple times. I'm talking about our far right, which has some resemblances to things happening in Europe, and I think in Hungary, although I don't know much about Hungary, Hungarian politics. But um, so there definitely is going to be probably another round of, and, and there has been all along, an effort by say city mayors or um, democratic politicians who are interacting with the anti-Trump resistance citizens groups that emerge after 2016 to engage in genuine discussion about policy alternatives. The right-wing politics I'm talking about is not really about policy alternatives for the most part. I did talk to you about the policy goals that you can see more on the ethno-nationalist right immigration restriction versus the ones you see for the free market millionaires and billionaires. But um, they have actually furthered a style of public political conduct. And um, action in our legislatures that takes the form of demonizing the other side. That's what they do. That's what they're thrilled about. And I, I can tell you that they are thrilled about it. The people who support this are absolutely thrilled at the um, racially charged liberal and Democrat insulting forms of politics that have now taken hold and are married to the Twitter modality, not just by Donald Trump, but by a lot of elected politicians. There's a good study that shows the rise of Twitter in Congress was very much tied to this kind of uh, never compromise, never reach a bargain, never talk through the policy alternatives. You see that right now. All you have to do is turn on your TV. You're gonna see the entire Republican party in America, in Congress, voting against giving free money to the citizenry, even though most of the American citizenry, including a near majority of the party, favor it. Why wouldn't they? Americans have lost their jobs. They've had to stay home. 
They're worried about getting vaccines. Their kids, kids back in school and the Biden administration is about to deliver on that. It's very popular, but all the Republicans are gonna vote against it because they're wedded to a style of politics that says, if they're there for it, we're against it. And we're not just against it, but we won't talk about it. And we're gonna insult them along the way. Uh, and, and by the way, once they pass it, we'll be able to insult them some more by talking about the fact that black and brown people are getting what they don't deserve. So just brace yourself. There's gonna be another two years of that. And I can tell you that some of the people I've interviewed at the grassroots on the right, people I otherwise like, I usually have to take a Tylenol after these interviews. <laughs> Maybe something stronger than a Tylenol after these interviews will be thrilled at that. So there's something about this uh, anger and hatred style that has definitely on the right overtaken policy deliberation. I mean that, but I'm not saying it's not there still uh, uh, in the rest of the spectrum. And I haven't talked about the, our research on those people. Um, disproportionately female, by the way. Now on the religion side, you know, this has got to be one of the hardest things for Europeans to understand. The United States, by not marrying church and state institutionally, historically, strengthened religion. It actually weakens religion to be tied up with government. That's going to prove to be true for the so-called Christian right. That's what they're going to find out over time. That's what European monarchs and official churches found out long ago. Historically, the United States was a place where, where religions, religious denominations and congregations competed for followers. And that strengthened their appeal. Uh, it, it does lead to fragmentation, but the most recent trends on the right have been the, the creation of these mega churches, which have thousands of congregants. And they are the places where these uh, preachers who may have their own radio programs, may have um, a multimedia operation that they present in their sermons, may have a radio program, may have a Wednesday program where people's lives are completely organized around the church congregation and what it does uh, in the absence of any other place where people interact outside of work. Much of non-metropolitan Amer America is that way. And some of those pastors are Christian nationalists, which means that, I just read this book and I wish I had read it before. It's a really good book called Taking God Back for America. It's based on systematic survey research that shows that not all evangelical Christian believers are Christian nationalists. And here's where you see the difference. And I saw it in some of my interviews. Some evangelical Protestants who are very conservative people think it is unchristian to treat refugees cruelly. That's what I learned in Sunday school too. I remember that. That's what they think. But Christian nationalists think it's okay to do the most extreme things because believers have to have a wall built around them. So they have a, a reading of theology that's different. Now, any religious tradition, any great religious tradition, for that many, many, any ideology can justify a very wide range of actions. So we shouldn't be surprised about this. But it's a very important distinction. And the latest research I've shows that many Christian nationalists are not even Christians. They don't go to church. They're not particularly interested in the Bible. They just see Americans' Christian identity as part of its national uniqueness, its greatness. I'm sure Hungary has its own version of this under right-wing uh, auspices. It's a defensive nationalism that I think we're seeing in many different countries now. Um, it's just that when it takes over a major political party and a great power and a two-party system, it's very dangerous. It's even more dangerous than if it takes over a third party or a fourth party um, in a parliamentary system. So uh, that's 
you know, all I can say about that is religion has been and remains extremely important. It's not even unimportant on the left. I mean, because African-American Christians are very important. And uh, in the smaller communities I visited where I found the anti-Trump activists, they were usually churchgoers. They simply go to the Church of Christ or the Presbyterian Church or, the, or my, they might be Methodists, my people, except Methodists are on both sides. Catholics tend to be on both sides. It depends on the priest. And um, so, and people in the local communities know perfectly well. They know which church is the, is the more conservative one and which is the more, they know exactly uh, what the lay of the land is because so much of life is organized around church going even to this day in non-big city America. So we're getting toward the end, but since I have seen two hands up, I will call on the two of you, please briefly, because we're going to have to uh, leave uh, Melissa Rousseau and Jean Cohen. Hi, Melissa. Um, yeah, once again, thank you so much. So um, my question is, um, um, Donald Trump seems to have a vulnerability and that's the law. Um, <laughs> He has all these criminal cases that are out there, some of which actually seem viable. Um, based on your research, will this have an impact on the center Republicans' ability to gain some ground? Great question. Jean, please. Jean, did you disappear? That's just back. Un unmute yourself, please. Oh, uh, please. Okay. You're gonna take the two questions together. Um, well, Melissa and I seem to go together. Uh, I mean, I was laughing because, of course, you're right about Christian nationalism, and Andrew and I even have a piece about that sort of thing. And they are what they accuse the Muslims of being. I mean, i.e., they are not a religion, but that's pretty funny. No. But that was the point. They're no, positive. that's true. They're yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm still obsessed with this party thing, not because I gave a talk on parties last week, but, you know, the problem is. Um, whether it is, whether what I'm about to describe is due to structural changes or political mistakes. Um, so what one can glean from your presentation and from a lot of literature out there is that the parties are losing, have lost control. What I mean is that they're no longer the ones who control the money that goes into their own politics. They're no longer the ones that even seem to control candidate selection, although, you know, that's the primary thing, it's it was more or less. Um, they don't control, there's no longer real party press. Um, and the press that was, America, we always into neutral press, but anyway, um, the media thing that, that uh, um, we were talking about is not under their control. Right, and, that's true. Although, of course, we need, you know, obviously got, getting, they were no, they, they, the party on the ground um, was eviscerated, maybe they can get it back. So the que my question is rather, is this, it's not whether you can go back to a mass party a la Europe, we never had one here, but um, is the capture of the Republican party and the evisceration, maybe it's being rebuilt now of the Democratic party, but not only, but you can also say the same, you see the same trends elsewhere. Is this due to some kind of structural trends or Mistakes that the parties made everywhere. Uh, like I, what I'm thinking is the what's it called? Um, the neoliberal stuff that they all embrace. There's another word for this, but new labor, whatever you want to call it. And so, I'm just I'm, I'm I, I don't know what you think about that, and I'm unsure for myself. So that's my question. We, still, we will let Data Scotchball uh, finish this. Uh, uh, okay, so. Question: If the um, authorities in New York State are able to make a tax case that's powerful, that will probably have a dual effect on Trump, um, Trump's support and following. It may very well loosen some of the more business-oriented and higher-educated Republicans further from uh, and, and 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 weaken him somewhat in the lead into the coming elections but it will redouble the support of his supporters, of course supporters, because they think he's persecuted. He presents himself as persecuted. They feel persecuted. It's all about 
feeling persecuted, which by the way, Americans in general are into being persecuted. Um, it's characteristic on the left as well. We are a people, all of whom are being persecuted. And we're all out there talking about how persecuted we are. But it's a very strong force in right-wing politics and it strengthens Trump. So it'll both strengthen and weaken him and it'll deepen this contradiction on the Republican side, which may make it impossible for a lot of Republican candidates to combine the suburban votes they need with the hardcore and win elections. And, um, you know, for the sake of American democracy, small d, I hope that's true. Um, parties. First of all, Donald Trump has strengthened the Republican Party, which is supremely ironic because he took it over because it was hollowed out. He has installed his own loyalists in the state and county committees. Uh, they are places that people attend meetings and are enthusiastic. They are stronger. On the Democratic side, we talk about that in some of the research in that new book that I put up there, Upending, where we looked at the state of Pennsylvania in great detail. And we looked at the question of whether these new resistance groups that emerged outside the Democratic Party in 2016 are strengthening the roots of the Democratic Party at the county level. And we have data on that across the state of Pennsylvania. And it turns out that in many places they are. Um, I happen to think that because of the asymmetries in American politics, it's more important that Democrats learn to strengthen as well as reform the Democratic Party. And I don't think that happens at the Democratic National Committee or in the donor core. I think it happens from the localities and the states up. And I'm quite intrigued by what uh, Stacey Abrams did in there. In, in, uh, and, and there are a few other states where you can say there are other models of strengthening state parties. That is the key. Because, you know, not every place is the same. The populations aren't the same. The economies aren't the same. Um, the challenges aren't the same, but I would look at Maine, I would look at Wisconsin, I would look at Nevada, a very different model based on unions, uh, and uh, I would look at Alabama, I mean, uh, Georgia, excuse me. And there are plenty of negative cases, most of the rest. But there are some important things happening at the grassroots in the state of Pennsylvania, which we, we actually describe in great detail in the final chapters of that book, and we've got another round of questionnaires out now. So we have been looking at the parties and, um, you know, strengthening a style of politics that combines civic action and new groups of people coming in with a strong party that can make compromises, <laughs> build support for multiple candidates. I mean, these are very old fashioned things and money is part of the key, but it's not really the whole key. Um, that's really important for Democrats in the United States and important for the center left probably everywhere across the Western world. Well, thank you very much. That was really quite wonderful. And not only because I agree with so much, but also because it was really wonderfully presented and argued. And I enjoyed this question and answer this uh, part. Well, me too. Well, thank you for your wonderful uh, questions. And I very much appreciated this. Thanks again. And thank everybody uh, for, right. for coming. Next, uh, 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 one week from now, we'll have Car Carlos de la Torre and Enrique Peruzzotti speaking about Latin America. And hope that all of you, many of you can join us. Uh, thanks a lot. <laughs>